Hello, I'm Suzanne Bronheim. I'm director of the SIDS and Other Infant Death Project at the National Center for Cultural Competence. Tawaris just talked to you about the framework for cultural competence, understanding what it is and how it applies to health promotion training. Now I'd like to spend some time talking to you about how we specifically apply that model to the work that we need to do. Before we talk about what to do, I want to talk a little bit about the values and guiding principles for assuring cultural and linguistic competence and health promotion messages and materials. The work that we do related to cultural competence has to be anchored with a set of values and principles so that we know when we're making decisions and figuring out what to do, what's guiding those decisions. The first value that I'd like to talk about is that cultural and linguistically competent health promotion approaches respect the values, beliefs, and practices of the intended audience. And of course, this is a principle of ours, but also, if we're going to be effective, we really have to be attuned to what our audience believes to begin with if we want to have an impact on their beliefs and their behaviors. The second principle I want to talk about is that culturally and linguistically competent health promotion is always undertaken within a context. And this becomes very important to guide our work because too often, we think about, we've gone out, we've told people what the information is, how to change their health beliefs, how to change their practices, and when they don't, we almost want to say, well, you know, see, they're not taking responsibility for changing in a way that will help their health. But we have to think about the context within which people live. For example, you know, the classic one is somebody might have diabetes and we say, you need to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, five or seven servings a day. But if you live in a neighborhood where there's no grocery store, there's only a little fast food market and then fast food outlets, and you can't get access to those fresh foods and vegetables, then we really haven't done our job as health promoters if we haven't taken that context into account. Another example, we talk about putting babies to sleep in a crib with a firm mattress, a firm surface. And the younger girls are somewhat receptive but then, too, sometimes they're in situations where they really can't control whether the baby's going to be on a firm mattress or not. They may not have that standard size crib that, you know, we recommend that they get. And um, they may not be able to control how many people are smoking in the house. Another principle of culturally and linguistically competent health promotion is that it recognizes the family and community as primary systems of support and intervention. Now this may be a little bit different focus for many of us who are used to sort of our predominant cultural view that each individual is responsible for themselves and what they do and, and how they uh, take care of their lives. But for folks from many different cultures, it's really the family as a whole or it might even be the community that really is seen as needing to come together to provide them the support that they need and to help them make the kinds of decisions they need. So when we're thinking about health promotion, we can't just think individual. We have to think in this broader kind of perspective. In addition, culturally and linguistically competent health promotion assures that its efforts exist in concert with natural and informal health care support systems. You know, those of us who are in the health profession kind of like to think that we're the only game in town. But in fact, for many individuals, for many families, they have other supports other systems that they look to for health, whether they're natural healers, they may be elders, um, they may be spiritualists. And if we're not thinking about those groups and including them in our process of health promotion, we're not going to be very successful because they may be the most credible voices for the families we want to reach. We know that there are certain elements that increase the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or of a baby passing away in its sleep. And one of those things we know is tobacco use, not ceremonial or sacred tobacco use, but commercial tobacco use, such as cigarettes. One thing that we have found that has been helpful in our view of tobacco as a sacred element for Native people, in the old days, tobacco was sacred element used in ceremony only. It was not abused as it is today in commercial tobacco products. Native children, therefore, were less prone to upper respiratory infections, asthma, allergies, and even SIDS. Now we know that we have to go back to this. Our traditional medicine teachings across all tribes that use tobacco hold it as a sacred element. Our traditional healers and practitioners 
are the ones to give this message that's appropriate for the community and the tribe. They're the ones to help with the prevention of using commercial tobacco products in the house, the ones to help with the cessation programs. We need to realize that they have to be included in any tobacco prevention program. We still use the Western methods. The programs, the cessation programs, the patches, they're all there and available, and yes, they are used. But we have found that with Native people, we have a greater success rate if traditional ways are included as well. An additional principle that we really want to talk about is that culturally and linguistically competent health promotion assures meaningful involvement of community members and key stakeholders. And we'll be talking about this more as we go along. But what's really very important is that we have to shift from seeing ourselves as the source of all wisdom that we're going out to give to people and understanding that we're going to need to find our partners within the community and work together with them. Now, I'd like to talk about um, a model for health promotion that those of you who are in public health probably know quite